We're going to move on to our first speaker, but I'm going to do something a little bit different for Emily. Emily, Emma. Um, our first speaker is Emmett Teeling, and instead of doing a formal introduction, today is Halloween, and I am going to introduce Emma with a poem. I've never done this before, but I woke up with this poem in my mind, so I'm going to recite it, and I'm not a poet. There comes a fair maiden from the north, where the nights are long and the days are short. Her name is Emma, and we follow her lead as she scours the caves in fearless deed. What are these creatures to whom she's devoted her life and given up her role as a devoted wife? <laughs> They're more numerous in species than mice and rats. They're the Chiroptera, those scary bats. <laughs> this Halloween night, we'll watch them take their flight and remember their genomes in pure delight. Emma. I'm going to take this away, so you have the whole poem. Well, uh, I think after that poem, um, that's it. My talk is now over. <laughs> but um, it is Halloween today, of all days, and this is a vampire bat. This is really what a vampire looks like. And you can get up real close and see the nice little pointy teeth. And yes, there are three species of vampires that are alive and with us today, and they do drink blood. Lapa, should I say. So what I want to do today is I want to talk to you about the research that I've been involved in now for the past 22, 23, keep going years. And the idea of, first of all, why should we sequence genomes? I want to talk about the most charismatic of all groups and how studying bats are going to find solutions to all of life's problems. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what level of standard do we need for our genomes. And I'm going to give you an example of why having these new level of standards that we can answer some of these questions that pertain to grand challenges we face in society. So first of all, there's our beautiful vampire bat taken by Brock Fenton, who spends all his time in caves. But we're here today to talk about the Earth Biogenome Project. And I really do think that this is actually the future of biology. We've got to think forward. It's a moonshot for biology that aims to sequence, catalogue, and characterise the genomes of all of Earth's eukaryotic biodiversity for over a period of 10 years. So that's a big goal. But I think we're going to be able to do it. And I think it's very important that we strive to do this, that we have a direction of where we need to go. So we've got approximately 9 million eukaryotes, 1 million that we know of. And the part I'm interested in here, and you can see that little red box, one single branch that diverged from all of the taxa about 85 million years ago, and these are the bats. And so one-fifth of all living mammals that we have on our planet today, they're bats. And these are these amazing pictures taken by one of my PhD students, again, who spent a lot of time in, in caves and in, in um, wonderful forests. Bats are extraordinary, extraordinary mammals. And I'm going to give you an example of why they're so extraordinary. Well, they're the only true flying mammal. They are the only group that have achieved true self-powered flight. That's a mammal. The other things just fall with style. They're your, uh, your, your, your uh, flying lemurs and your gliding squirrels and so forth. But flight, it's a difficult um, trait to acquire. It's highly metabolically costly. And it has only evolved very few times on our planet ever. So the only true flying mammal. So we should sequence a flying genome. They also use laryngeal echolocation. They're able to perceive and move around in their environment in complete darkness. I've seen amazing footage of bats taking huge spiders out of webs in complete darkness and not getting entangled in the webs using sound alone. And if you really want to experience life with an alien species, the famous philosopher Thomas Nagel said, lock yourself in a cupboard with an echolocating flying bat in complete darkness. So they're very different. Great big ears, strange <laughs> nose leaves. And most of the bats can echolocate. But there's one family of bats that do not, and they're the pteropodas. And these are these old world fruit bats that you find in Australia, the great big huge ones that sometimes put the fear of God into people. But if you look at them, they have much larger eyes, they have much smaller ears, and it looks like potentially a trade-off has happened in how mammals perceive the world in a relatively recent time frame. So studying bat genomes can allow us 
understand trade-offs that happen at the sensory level. And again, your senses is what evolution acts on, that really it's at the frontier, it's at the very front line of our war and of how we interact with our environment. So if you want to understand evolutionary processes, you need to understand sensory perception. So studying bats allows us to do this. I want to talk to you about the fact that also bats live for an extraordinary long time. One of the challenges of the Earth Biogenome Project is to find solutions to allow us age more healthily. Bats live for a huge, way longer than we expected given their body size. So this species is Myotis branti. It holds a record for longevity. Caught as an adult and then caught 42 years later with no signs of aging. And we underestimate how long bats can actually live for. If you were to correct for body size, we'd find that this bat lives the equivalent of 258 human years without any showing any signs of aging. So they don't age. And I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about how studying our genomes can address this question. They also carry all these absolutely horrible, nasty pathogens. Ebola, rabies, SARS, MERS, Marburg. Right, should we run out and kill them all? No. What we need to do is they can tolerate and live with these viruses, and they have evolved the mechanisms to be able to do this. So we should study this tolerance that's evolved in the mammal and understand what are they doing at the molecular level to allow this tolerance and this rare immunity. They have the solutions to being able to live with these viruses. We do not have them yet. They also provide crucial ecosystem services. They're major pollinators in the neotropics. I mean, they pollinate plants that make tequila. This is very, very important to most of my undergrads. <laughs> but they're required for, for functioning of our ecosystems. Also, with here within the UK and within Ireland, they are keystone predators that moderate different arthropod pests. And without bats, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. So again, we need to understand these different species. Eric and Sonia Vernes, so she is a founding director of Bat 1K with myself, are also interested in studying bats because they use vocal learning. They have a very unusual way of communicating, and their brain starts to potentially could be like ours. And so to try and understand how we can communicate and how we learn, maybe studying bats is a good example. And Eric could talk to you about that much better. They're also talking about moonshots. So we've got to the moon. There's lots of other planets out there. But if we want to go and be able to take and go into outer space, we're going to have to be able to find a way to go into torpor. But not even torpor, if you think about it. Say you have your arm in a cask, you've broken your wrist, you have to have physio if you haven't moved in six weeks. When bats hibernate, they do not move for up to four or five months, potentially a little bit of shivering every now and then, but they can fly away when the temperature heats up. How have they evolved that mechanism? You can use this for much longer um, levels of surgery and so forth. So again, answers to a lot of these questions lie within the bat genome. I'm a phylogeneticist. This is what got me originally interested in bats. We still yet haven't resolved all of the bat tree. There are certain nodes in our tree that are very, very difficult to resolve, particularly because they had a lot of very quick evolution. But if you look at, so you've got 1,300 species of bat. Right now, only 0.1% of all bat diversity is represented by a genome that's being published. So we have to try and resolve that so we can address all of these key, interesting, cool traits that have evolved within this lineage alone. And so the bats, they don't just have one, they have them all. So I want to talk to you now a little bit about why, which I've spoke to you about before, but how are we to study bats and their genomes? This is Placotus auretus, lovely long-eared bat, one of my favorites. So to do this, I was involved in Genome 10K and working with Eric on VGP and uh, quite inspired by the whole bat uh, bird 10K and thought, well, well, maybe we could do this with bats. Maybe we could find a way that we could sequence all bat genomes. The technology was moving forward. Maybe this was going to be possible. Originally, we thought we'd just look at the family level. We thought, well, actually, let's try and see, could we sequence all bat genomes? But how do you do this? You've got to bring together a group of like-minded people who are equally as crazy. And so to do this, Sonia Vernies, so she's one of the founding directors with myself, um, we decided, well, let's try and bring people together who are sequencing genomes who might be interested in bats. So Sonia Vernies, David Ray, Jean Myers, who's here, Michael Hiller, Tom Gilbert, Liliana Davalos. We pretty much all got together, and we started having meetings every month to think about, well, how are we going to do this? What do we want to do? So we decided that we should do it. 
question was, how were we going to do it? Well, what we wanted to do, we wanted to sequence the genome of all living bat species that we know of, but to chromosome level error-free assemblies. We wanted to uncover the genomic basis of their unique traits and their extraordinary adaptations, and ultimately drive a global conservation and awareness. So this is what we wanted to do, but the question was, how are we to do it? So I've worked with bats for you know, longer than I care to, to talk about, but there are a whole bunch of people on the ground who are the conservation biologists, people who are not academics, people who are not genomicists, people who are not computer scientists, who have actually understand the biology. They have access to the samples. So we want to try and bring all of these people together. So we designed BAT1K, which is a consortium. There's now 300 people that are signed up. We have over 1,000 Twitter followers who've all agreed and pledged samples. And so it's trying to get samples from all around the world. This is what you need. And these samples, so lots of people are pledging all the time saying, we want to help, we want to help, we want to help. That's all well and good. So we said, well, let's come up. We have to have our website. People can sign up. If you're interested, please sign up. And we decided we we're going to do this in, in three phases. Phase one was going to be all the families. There's 21 families, if you believe my trees. Next, we're going to do the, gener the, gener the generic level, which is 222. And then we're going to try, next phase three was do all of the species. And right now, thanks to Gene Myers and Max Planck funding, we have funding for phase one. And for phase one, we're going to sequence all, a representative of every bat family, to chromosome, chromosome level, hopefully error-free assemblies. And this fits in nicely with the first, the 9,000 families for EBP to reference level. So we're doing this. How are we going to do it? So the goal is to produce reconstructions with a contig of N50 of 1 MBP or greater, a scaffold of N50 of 10 MBP or greater, at least 90% of these contigs mapped to chromosomes. We're working on that. And a consensus accuracy of Q40 or better. Now, this 342 Q40 assembly score, um, I believe Harris and Richard Durbin were involved directly in trying to make this work, and this is what we were aiming to do. And how are we going to do it? What technology are we going to use? So first of all, we want PacBio. We're using long-read technology. So we're going to have 60x PacBio. 50x Illumina reads in these 10x read clouds. This is what we're planning to do. It's what we're doing at the moment. We're going to use bio-nano bio optical mapping. And then 10x Illumina reads in long-range high-C read pairs. This is the idea that let's try and see what we can do. So what does it look like? So Gene Myers and his crew in Dresden are also working on how do you assemble and put these different types of data together to get a very meaningful and correct and accurate assembly. And it's Martin Pippel who's been driving this. So right now what you can see here, well, you can try and see it, um, you can see that our M50 ranges from 7.1 to 32.3. These are for our current genomes at the moment. They're getting better. And right now, as you can see here, this is hugely better, nearly 100-fold better than the best assembled genome that's published to date. So it goes from 0 0.01 to about 1.5. So right now, we've got longer reads, and they should be better. But I'm always asked the question, you're going to advocate for these reference level genomes. Are you um, wanting perfection? And is that going to come at a price for trying to get, find the answer to these questions? But I want to show you why it's important. And I want to show you using one of our phenotypes. And this is the stuff I've been working on now for the past six years. So right now, society is faced with a grand challenge. All around us, our populations are aging. And they're aging and aging and aging. People are living way, way longer. But there's a problem. And the problem is that even though we have this expected increase in lifespan, a 380% increase in people over, living over the age of 80 by 2050. That's very soon. Our probability of acquiring disease of the old age, cancer, Alzheimer's, dementia, it's still stayed the same. It's still at 60. So even though we have this expected increase in lifespan, do we really want to live 20, 30, 40, 50 years incapacitated. We need right now to find a way to solve our aging problem with a view to helping extend human health span. And I believe that this is one of the big um, remits of the welcome. So how are we going to do it? Aging is inherently complex. We still don't really understand the aging process. We've had great insights from model organisms such as flies and nematodes and mice. 
And you find that the aging process is highly regulated and mediated by conserved signaling pathways and transcription factors. That's good. We spend a lot of our time in the lab working with these short-lived <coughs> organisms, some of them very inbred, that actually, quite frankly, are very bad at living and they're very good at dying. That's why we pick them. So we can study their generations within our own lifespan. But does this translate to long-lived long outbred mammals such as us? And I'm going to argue that actually to address this question, you need to study nature solutions to this problem, and these are the bats. And that bats, you can use them as an unconventional mammalian system to understand healthy aging. So typically in nature, small things live fast, die young. Think of a shrew, think of a mouse. Big things live slow, live long. So there's a correlation, nearly a correlation of one between body size and longevity, given metabolic rate that drives this. But bats are the outlier. There are 90 species of mammal that live longer than man, given their body size, and these are wild species. 18 of these are bats, and the other one is a naked mole rat, another very interesting model system. There's only one rodent that's showing this, maybe a bunch of the sister taxa, but I think most bats can do this, and there's 1,300 of them. So let's coalesce back and look at the, what has evolved in the ancestor of all bats that underlies this longer health span. So I set up a, a study funded by the ERC and the Irish Research Council, whereby we were able to go out year after year after year, uh, develop the non-lethal methods to sample long-lived bats in France every year and take a little bit of blood and a little bit of wing, sequence the entire transcriptome, look at telomeres, look at mitochondrial diversity, and see what happens in these long-lived species as they age. It's all tricky, I can tell you all about it later. But to do this, we wanted to ask the question, how do bats defy the aging process? So this kind of, after all of this work, field work, crying, anguish, trying to make methods work, is really the take home message. So this is from blood transcriptome data. And when you look at bats and you compare them to human, mice, and actually wolf, and again, what you wanted to have is blood transcriptome data, and we were looking at all of the transcripts that were expressed and seeing could you find a correlation with either this um, expression increasing with age or decreasing? What you find in red is that bats show this increase in the maintenance of their DNA and their DNA repair mechanisms. And it's seen again and again and again in their transcripts. They also seem to find a way to have immunological homeostasis too as they age, which is very different to us and to mice and to the other um, samples that we had in different species we looked at. So seeing that bats are able to increase the maintenance of the DNA as they age, this maybe explains why they don't get cancer. Of all of the uh, records ever, there's two. These are a very weird fluke bat in captivity that showed any signs of cancer. You speak to any bat biologist, you don't see this. But okay, what underlies this? And I'm going to argue that it's all in the regulation. And the reason why, I, I learned this the hard way. So we spent six years mining the genomes that are out there, looking for candidate markers involved in pathways that maybe underlie healthy aging in bats. Um, I thought it was going to take six months. It took us six years. We had to design a whole bunch of different pipelines and algorithms to be able to go in. And we had to mine the raw data, the original fastest sequences from these genomes because they were so badly annotated. And that if everything is in, and what we find, it looks like it's potentially in the reg. So it's the regulation of these pathways, rather than after doing all our candidate looking, um, looking for evidence of differential selection that was occurring within these genes, we found that after looking at about 7,000 candidate genes across 96 mammals where we aligned them, we did a whole bunch of selection tests, we found potentially two that maybe showed some form of divergent selection. It was when you actually went and you looked at the regulation Look at these microRNAs that potentially it's the regulation of these pathways that underlies this longevity transcription phenotype that you see in bats. Well, what does that mean? If we want to look at the regulatory regions, which aren't the coding regions, across multiple different taxa, across an Earth Biogenome project, we're going to need exquisite genomes. This is an example of just looking at this three prime UTR with this one species of bat that we're looking at. You have a 10X genome and a PAC bio genome. When we're trying to identify the three prime UTRs that maybe the microRNAs are working on, and you find that a huge increase, you can actually uncover them so much more in these exquisite genomes. 
And this is just a single example, but I think it's all on the regulation. It's going to be a lot more than just the microRNAs, long non-coding RNAs, a bunch of epi uh, epigenetic markers. But we're going to need really good genomes to do that. And this is just an example. We're working on getting more examples of why you need the reference quality genomes. What's the future? So as a comparative evolutionary biologist, I'm interested in taking our information that we get now from our genomes, from a wildlife study, incorporating it all together, and finding a way that we can now develop methods to move from correlation into causation. And yes, that is a vampire looking even more nasty. But I think if we want to move into the idea of this ex vivo analysis or any translational studies using non-model organisms, using our genomes, we need to have exquisite genomes to be able to do that. And this is another reason why we need the reference level assembly. But to get back to the start, this is a moonshot. And I just watched First Man. Um, and again, I'm married to a physicist, and I know that they can get lots of money for lots of things. And he used to work in NASA, and asking for you know, 10 billion is nothing. That's what they do all the time. But I want to quote from John F. Kennedy about a moonshot. So we chose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept and one that we are unwilling to postpone. I think the time's right now. We're saying we want to sequence all of life to do this we're going to have to come up with the methods. It's difficult. How do you get the samples? How do you ship them around? We've got to find the ways to stabilize that DNA that doesn't involve just freezing it. How do we bring everything together? How do you get over the Nagoya Treaty and Protocol? How do we do this? And I think that with a bunch of like-minded people, we can find the answer. And this is going to revolutionize biology. And I'm glad that bats are a part of it. And if you're interested in all of this, join us and read that paper. Thank you.